All right, everyone, welcome back to our next lecture in Module 3. Today we're going to talk about protus. Now, the word protus is kind of like a catch-all term for a whole different bunch of different um, organisms. And uh, it's going to be unsurprising to you to see that many of them don't share similar characteristics, but they share a few. Um, but let's just get into it. There's over 100,000 described living species of protus, likely many more. Like I've been saying uh, for the past couple of lectures, and what you'll hear in the, in the future is that we've described a number of species, right? 100,000 scientists have described. It's very, very likely and ex extremely likely that there's many, many, many more. And it's really unclear how many more undescribed species of protus might exist. And the reason for that is many protists live in symbiotic relationships with other organisms. And so it's just going to be hard to find them. The term protist, like I said before, it's the catch-all term for eukaryotic organisms. Okay, so eukaryotic organisms that have membrane-bound organelles and nuclei that are not animals, plants, fungi, or any single phylogenetically related group. So that's going to be not surprising that there's going to be a few characteristics. Um, there, there will be few characteristics that are common to all protists. We'll talk about some, though. Nearly all protists exist in some type of aquatic environment. Freshwater or marine environments, damp soil, even snow. But that's one that is pretty common. They're going to be in an aquatic environment. Several protist species are parasites that infect animals or plants. Remember that a parasite is an organism that has to live on or in another organism and feeds off of it. And often, without, it doesn't kill it. A few protist species live on dead organisms or their wastes and contribute to their decay, so they are decomposers. The cells of protists are, surprisingly, among the most elaborate of all cells. You might think, well, they're very small, tiny, microscopic organisms. They can't be that elaborate, but they actually are. Most protists, like I said, are microscopic and unicellular, but there are some true multicellular forms. A few protists actually live as colonies that behave in sort of like a group of free living cells, and sort of like this multicellular organism, but it's actually a bunch of small single-celled organisms. Still, other protists are composed of enormous multinucleate single cells that look like amorphous blobs of slime, or in other cases, they look like ferns. So really interesting. In fact, many protist cells are multinucleated. What that means is that for one cell, there is more than one nucleus. In some species, the nuclei are different sizes, and they'll have distinct roles in the protist cell function. Single protist cells range in size from less than a micrometer to the three meter lengths of the multinucleate cells of the seaweed calerpa. I'll show you a picture of that on the next slide. Protocells cells might be enveloped by animal-like cell membranes, or they could have plant-like cell walls. So you can see how we're talking about many different aspects of protists, and there's not many that are, you know, the same for all of them. Others could be encased in a glassy, silica-based shell, or wound with pellicles, of interlocking protein strips. So they're just they're just all over the place. The pellicle functions like this flexible coat of armor. It prevents the protus from being torn or pierced, and it allows it to um, continue to hold on to its range of motion. Here is that Calerpa seaweed. So this entire thing is one cell. Pretty big cell, huh? You might not have thought, oh, that's about one cell. If you, I certainly wouldn't have. Um, but that's one cell, and it's a protist. And over here is a tiny microscopic euglena that is also one cell. So these are both protists. Uh, pretty weird to find that much variety in one class, but that's what we are. So let's talk about how protists move. Um, there's going to be three different distinct ways. The first, like we'll see in this paramecium, is that they'll have these tiny microscopic hair-like structures on the outside of their cell called cilia, and those cilia will vibrate back and forth, and it'll kind of, oh, it'll kind of move around um, that way with the cilia, the tiny microscopic hair-like structures. The amoeba, on the other hand, 
will make these things called pseudopods. Pseudo means fake, pod or pod means foot, so they're fake feet, and they kind of put all of their um, extra intracellular fluid into these little foot-like shapes, and they'll reach over and then they'll grab onto something and move over. So those are pseudopods. And then this euglena, like we saw in the last slide, has a flagellum, which is like how sperm cells move around with these tails, and those just beat um, and, and twirl around, and they, uh, you know, swim with a, with a beating tail called a flagella. So there's three ways in which protists move. How do they obtain energy? They exhibit many forms of nutrition, and they could be aerobic, which means they need oxygen, or they could be anaerobic. They are, there are some photosynthetic protists, which we call photoautotrophs, and they are characterized by the presence of, of course, chloroplasts, where that photosynthesis happens. Other protists are heterotroph, which means that they have to eat another organism, and that, that means they consume organic materials. Amoebas and some other heterotrophic protist species actually ingest particles by a process called phagocytosis. Now, where have we heard the word phagocytosis before? Well, if you remember, that's how sponges eat, with that cellular eating, where they basically take those two pseudopods and engulf a piece of food, and they take it into the cell. Um, and that's just what that says here. The cell membrane engulfs a food particle, brings it inward, pinching off an intracellular membranous sac or vesicle that it contains the food called the food vacuole. How do they reproduce? They reproduce by a variety of mechanisms. It shouldn't be surprising to you that there's not one way. Most are capable of some form of asexual reproduction like binary fission, where you just split in half basically. That happens here in the top left. One, there's the nucleus, the nuclear, the nuclear membrane breaks down, the DNA unravels, and then they pop into two. And you can see the nucleus reforming here, two identical cells. Um, um, uh, and then you could also do multiple fission, which would just a bunch of them sim dividing simultaneously into many daughter cells. Others could produce tiny buds right here. He's producing a tiny bud, um, and that, uh, that will go on to divide and grow into the size of the parental protist. Yep. So there's budding on the top right and binary fission on the top left. Sexual reproduction involving meiosis and fertilization, just like our sexual reproduction, is also common among protists. And many protist species can actually switch from asexual to sexual reproduction when necessary. Sexual reproduction is often associated with periods when nutrients are depleted or environmental changes occur. Now, let's think about that. It might, why would uh, they want to switch to sexual reproduction when their environment is changing? Well, sexual reproduction might allow the protists to do genetic recombination and produce new variations of progeny, or basically the next generation, that might be better suited to surviving in the new environment. Think about it. If humans could only reproduce asexually by budding, we would all look the same, right? We would look the, have looked the same since the very first humans evolved, um, you know, a few million years ago. Uh, our environment is quite different, and we have not made huge changes, but slight changes here and there that have made us better suited to our environment. So that's what sexual reproduction allows organisms to do to get this genetic chance, this genetic recombination that could produce new variations into the population that are better suited to the environment. So if their environment is changing or nutrients aren't very variable, uh, very, very available, they're going to switch to sexual reproduction and hopefully produce better suited uh, progeny. This is often associated with cysts, which is this a protective resting stage. That's a cyst right here, that purple part. The cysts are particularly resistant to extreme temperatures and drying out or being in a very low or acidic pH. And that strategy allows certain protists to basically wait out the stressors in their environment until that environment becomes more favorable for survival again. They can also be attached. You can see how um, they have these little strands hanging off that could get attached to something and then be carried to a new environment which is better than the old environment. So really good way of surviving. Let's talk about their diversity. With the advent of DNA sequencing where we were literally able to take the A's, G's, T's, and C's in the DNA code and read them, the relationships among the protist groups and between protist groups and other eukaryotes are beginning to become clearer. 
many relationships that were based on morphological similarities, basically what they look like, are now being replaced by new relationships based on genetic similarities. Because they could look alike, but genetically they could be very dissimilar. And so it's always better to look at the genetics. Protists that exhibit similar morphological features may have evolved analogous structures, something we call analogous structures, because of similar selective pressures, rather than because of recent common ancestry. And I'll talk about an analogous structures here in a second. This phenomenon of getting analogous, um, evolved analogous structures because of common uh, pressures, selective pressures, that's called convergent evolution. And it's one reason why looking at protists and trying to classify them is so challenging. Um, before I get into that, let's give two examples of, um, of analogous structures. So look at a bird's wing and a bat's wing. Those are similar structures. And they also are made up of similar uh, parts. There's bones, right, and skin. Um, but so those are called homologous structures, two structures that do the same thing and are made up of the same parts. Now think of a bat wing and a butterfly wing. Now they do the same thing. They are, uh, they, they do the same thing. They're used for flying around, right? But they're, in the butterfly wing, you don't see skin and bones, right? They're insect parts, just to, to make it very basic. And so those are called analogous structures. They do the same thing. They evolved because there were similar selective pressures, meaning that they um, give the, the organism some sort of advantage in their environment, but they're not exactly the same genetically. And so we call those analogous structures. So I hope that makes sense. We'll probably talk about those later on in this class as well. Okay, let's talk about the important human pathogens of protists. Many protists are pathogenic parasites that must infect other organisms in, able to uh, in order to survive and propagate. Protist parasites include the causative agents of malaria, African sleeping sickness, and waterborne gastroenteritis in humans. Other protist pathogens prey on plants and they affect massive destruction of food crops. Unfortunately, the, the plant pathogens are probably the, the, the more dangerous on the world scale. Here's Plasmodium. Um, the genus Plasmodium must infect a mosquito and a vertebrate to complete their life cycle. So, you know, if you ever hear about people that are unfortunately infected with malaria and end up dying from malaria, they actually aren't being killed by the mosquito bite. They're being killed by this plasmodium, this protist that's getting, that was picked up by the mosquito and left on the, the human after the mosquito uh, sucks their blood. Um, the parasite develops in liver cells, goes on to infect red blood cells, bursting from and destroying the blood cells of each asexual replication cycle. Um, malaria is obviously very, very bad. Of the four plasmodium species known to infect humans, P. falciparum accounts for 50% of all malaria cases and is the primary cause of disease-related fatalities in the tropical regions of the world. In 2010, it was estimated that malaria caused between whew, 0.5 and 1 million deaths, mostly in African children. And so obviously, um, I think we're pretty much all very familiar with how big of a problem malaria is. Um, but the, now you know that it's caused by a protist. Here are some plant pathogens. Um, this uh, downy mildew and the powery, uh, powery mildew caused the collapse of the French wine industry years back. And also uh, the, the potato famine on the right, uh, potato blight, potato famine caused the potato famine in Ireland. And um, so very two huge um, cause of disease in, in plants cause huge uh, death numbers in humans. And those are protists. Okay, well, instead of just leaving you on a bad note, let's talk about the beneficial protists, because there are some. They play critically important ecological roles as producers, particularly in the world's oceans. They are equally important on the other end of food webs as decomposers as well. And so they are the primary producers, and the last thing that gets those, those dead things back into a usual form as decomposers. They are essential sources of nutrition for many other organisms. In some cases, like in plankton, protists are consumed directly. Well, think, think of things that eat plankton, like whale sharks, for example. Alternatively, photosynthetic protists serve as producers of nutrition for other organisms by carbon fixation. That's what happens during photosynthesis. You take an unusable carbon in carbon dioxide and make it into a sugar, which is glucose C6 
H12O6, six carbons. One instance is photosynthetic dinoflagellates called zooxanthellae. We might have heard of those when we talked about coral. Pass on most of their energy to the coral polyps that house them. So the coral polyps are eating things out of the water, but it's not going to be enough energy. So they have these photosynthetic dinoflagellates called zooxanthellae that live within them, give them their bright color, and get extra energy from photosynthesis. So pretty cool. Let's look at coral polyps and zooxanthellae. You call this a mutually beneficial relationship. The polyps give them a protective environment, and there's nutrients also for the zooxanthellae that the polyps get from eating. The polyps secrete that calcium carbonate that builds um, coral reefs. But without the dinoflagellate symbionts, corals lose those pigments. But we've seen this process called coral bleaching, and they cannot survive that. They will eventually die. This explains why reef building corals do not reside in waters deeper than about 20 meters, 60 feet, because not enough light can reach those depths for the dinoflagellates to photosynthesize. So hopefully you've learned something a little bit about coral bleaching there. Here's an example of a healthy reef on the left. This is a staghorn coral, a bunch of staghorn coral. You can see this brand new white tip is the, is the leading tip of the growing coral. Very healthy reef here. And unfortunately, um, what we're seeing more and more is um, bleaching events. This usually happens when the water becomes too acidic or too warm, usually too warm, and those dinoflagellates uh, die. And once that happens, the coral polyps are just bright white. And they're not dead yet, but they will be dead soon. Um, and that's a very, very unfortunate um, side effect of global climate change that uh, scientists are working on figuring out, of course. Um, very sad scene here that always brings me down. But let's talk about more benefits. Approximately one quarter of the world's photosynthesis is conducted by protists, particularly the dinoflagellates, the diatoms, and of course multicellular algae. They do not create food sources only for sea-dwelling organisms. For instance, certain anaerobic species exist in di the digestive tracts of termites and wood-eating cockroaches, and they allow them to digest cellulose, which like I told you before, most organisms can't digest cellulose, like it's good roughage for us, for instance, but those dinoflagellates can, um, and they uh, allow those termites and wood-eating cockroaches to uh, eat the wood that they're boring through. And there's also many fungus-like protists, which are saprobes, which are the organisms that feed on the dead organisms or the waste matter, and of course they are decomposers. For instance, many types of oomycytes grow on dead animals or algae. Saprobic protists have the essential function of returning inorganic nutrients to the soil and water. I think I've said this about five times now, but very, very important. If we didn't have decomposers, we'd be standing in piles of crap. This process allows for new plant growth. It generates sustenance for other organisms through, through that uh, plant growth. Um, without the saprobic species like protists, fungi, bacteria, life would, would cease to exist at some point because all the organic carbon would become tied up or essentially unusable in the dead bodies. Okay, guys, uh, that was Protus. Hope you enjoyed it, and I'll see you in the next one. Bye.